there's a also another aspect of this because both in Chinese uh, uh, modern literature now and media, we hear the story of the that there was a historical maritime Silk Road uh, with the uh, the fleet which uh, the Admiral Zheng He was leading and so on. You yourself have actually written a several books. You can as well tell us about the books you have written about the history of the Silk Road. But let please tell us a little bit about the the ancient history of the maritime Silk Road. Yeah. Well, um, let's start first with the, the Admiral Zhi Shi Ho, which I believe is the correct pronunciation. And we'll look, have a look at his voyages and then I'll discuss uh, a little bit further. Now, Admiral uh, Shen Ho was uh, a eunuch uh, admiral of the fleet and he was dispatched by the emperor on um, seven voyages in total in the beginning of the 15th century. And in his lecture, in his speech in Indonesia, uh, President Xi Jinping refers specifically to this because basically he juxtaposes the largest and most powerful fleet in world history, visits these neighboring countries and does not attack anyone. They come in peace and establish good and friendly relations with each other. Now, I have to confess that he doesn't go to war with anyone, so it's basically peaceful. Um, there's an elimination of a little piracy problem and a little regime change, but it depends who's writing about that, whether you interpret that as peaceful or not. But basically, these voyages are anchored into the current discourse on the Silk Road. It is a country, a continent, a sea dominated by the Asians. The Europeans haven't arrived yet. And China is arriving with this huge treasure fleet. And Presidency, uh, sorry, Admiral Zheng Ho makes seven voyages. Now, they all follow the same pattern in the beginning. They go through um, what is now Indonesia, through the Malay Peninsula. And then the first four voyages end in the southern tip of, of India. And they go no further. And they return with uh, ambassadors to the court of the emperor. And the ambassadors come often from further afield. They've come from Africa and from Arabia, but the, they come to the Chinese and they go back. The ambassadors then stay. They offer tribute to the emperor. And the emperor, because he is the emperor, gives a bigger tribute back. And there's a bit of trade done on the side. Now, after those first four voyages on the next three, the fleet probably splits and they begin to become more adventurous. So I don't think the whole fleet does goes on the further voyages, but certainly um, Ch Ch Chinese ships do. And they visit first the Arabia. They certainly get as far as Jeddah because we have an eyewitness account of the seventh uh, voyage from that. And they may or may not have reached uh, Africa themselves. Certainly the Africans managed to reach them because there are Africans uh, at the court of uh, the emperor. So is this idea of peace, peaceful communication between peoples that it helps to brand the Maritime Silk Road with its uh, greater um, region of prosperity for all? Now, the, probably even in ancient times, the Silk Road by sea was much more important in trade than the overland route. Camels, um, considering the camel train also has to carry the luggage for the camels, their feed, the feed for the people, the tents and everything else, the camel probably doesn't carry much more than 500 grams, half, 500 kilograms, sorry, half a ton at the most. And a camel train would be, what, 40, 48 camels. You can see it's not a lot of tonnage, whereas see, even in those days, a simple uh, dao would carry a um, 100 tons or more. So what you can see early on is that there is a trade coming from China by sea and reaching, now we don't know how, it picks up, we think, with uh, Malay uh, sailors inside the Bay of Bengal, and that the Arab sailors probably dominate the route from the Arabian Sea onwards. So the first thing of the Chinese voyages, this is probably the first time that Chinese ships en masse 
have ventured outside this area of uh, East Asia. So that's how the, the overland routes have gone. And not only uh, goods travel that way, but people also begin to travel large distances by ship in this period. Yeah, I think in the history of the Arab world, which I have a bit knowledge of, there was enormous also communication prior to Zheng He's uh, trips. Yeah. Arabs were doing trade with Malaysia, Indonesia, and Muslim uh, seafarers and travelers like Ibn Battuta and others, they have reported their trips even all the way to China and back. So this has been a historical, we have the uh, the trade winds, you know, because they yes. travel with the, the sail ships, travel with the, with the uh, monsoon seasons, once to the east and once to the west. And, so that's a very fascinating history. I, yes, mean, I think so. so it's, but it's anyway, so that's great. That's interesting.